Good evening, everyone. Welcome to St. Stephen the Martyr. Special welcome to all of our guests here tonight, especially Father Carlos Martins, who is a member of the Companions of the Cross, but on special assignment for this Vatican mission of the relics, which he'll explain uh, more about. It's such a, a grace to welcome these relics to our uh, parish, and so we're excited to have him, and let us uh, welcome Father Carlos Martins. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we praise and thank you for your saints. We praise and thank you for your Holy Spirit, your saint maker. We invite and invoke the Holy Spirit upon ourselves this day and give him permission to likewise make us saints. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As Father mentioned, my name is Father Carlos Martins, and I have a unique ministry in the church. I work with the Vatican and bring a very large exhibit of relics of the saints to churches, schools, and prisons throughout the world. And of all of the things that I do in my work as a priest, these expositions are my favorite work. Why? Because I get to give people an experience of the living God through the relics of his saints. And what do I mean by giving people an experience of the living God? I mean the following. I was at a church in Houston, Texas. A man came and attended the exposition, a man born paralyzed. He was born without the use of his legs, and he had spent all of his 55 years in a wheelchair. He attended the presentation. Afterwards, he went into the hall where the relics were displayed and he wheeled himself over to one of the reliquaries, to one of the containers that holds and displays a relic. And he placed his hand on top of it. He got up out of his wheelchair, and he walked home. The same week I was at a school, in attendance was a little nine-year-old girl with cancer. The cancer had manifested itself in the form of a very large tumor, approximately five inches in diameter, and it was poking out of her lower abdomen. And the cancer was killing her. She placed her hands on top of all of the reliquaries, as you will be able to do so today. And during which, and afterwards, she didn't notice anything extraordinary. She didn't feel any differently than she had when she had come in. But what she noticed is when she sat down in the back seat of her parents' car for the ride home, there was no tumor on her lap. Her cancer was healed completely and instantly and imperceptibly. God touched her so gently, she didn't even perceive it. That's God. God is a perfect gentleman. There is no violence whatsoever within him. When he touches, he does so so gently that we often don't even perceive it. And that little girl that day allowed him into her heart. And once inside, he was able to perform the work that he wanted to perform. And thanks be to God, today her stomach is perfectly flat. This is what God chooses to do through the relics of his saints. Every saint lived his or her life as a giant billboard pointing to God. But God in his mystery also points to his saints as his masterpieces of creation. And so I'm going to make you a guarantee today. If you give God your heart wholly and completely today, holding nothing back, if you permit God to be the Lord of your life and of every part of your life today, then you will experience the presence and power of the living God today in a way unlike you've ever experienced before. 
I guarantee you. To experience the presence and power of the living God, however, more than just the mere desire for that experience is needed. I'll explain what I mean by that. I'm a convert from atheism myself. I converted 25 years ago. During my atheist days, if you had made me the same guarantee that I've just made you, I would have always taken you up on that offer. Never would I have rejected it. But it would have required more than just my mere desire for the experience of God to bring that experience about. It would have required me to remove from my heart those things that would stand as obstacles to God's entry. Because as I mentioned, God is a perfect gentleman. He enters the heart where he has been invited and where room has been made for him. And so as a priest, I'm going to list what I perceive to be the four most common roadblocks, or what I like to call handcuffs, that we place on God, preventing him from entering our hearts and acting within our lives the way he desires. The first handcuff is a refusal to attend Sunday Mass. Mass, the Eucharist, is one of the seven sacraments. And the seven sacraments are the seven ways Jesus Christ left to heal the world. To refuse the sacraments, of which the Eucharist is the source and summit of the other six sacraments, so teaches the Church, is to refuse God. Period. I couldn't put it more simply than that. The second handcuff is a refusal to confess our sins sacramentally, a refusal to go to confession to a priest. I travel the world with this ministry. I hear the same thing almost everywhere where I go. Well, Father, I don't do confession anymore. I used to. But now I just confess my sins directly to God. And my response to that is, oh, how nice. And tell me, which God is forgiving you? Because it's not the God of Jesus Christ, it's not. Because Jesus was very clear in the Gospel of John when he made his first resurrection appearance to his apostles, his first priests. He breathed on them and he said to them this, Peace be with you. If you forgive men's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. These are the words of Jesus Christ. Friends, we have no right to tell God the manner in which he would choose to forgive our sins. We have no right. We don't do that to one another. If I offend you, I would never come up to you and give you the terms by which you would accept my apology. If I were to try to pull that, what would you do with my apology? You'd toss it in the nearest trash can. That's what you would do. So if we don't do that to one another, why on earth would we do that to God? The third handcuff is a refusal to make a complete disclosure of our sins within the sacrament of confession. And this is the handcuff, friends, that hangs over half of all Catholics. And so what I'm talking about is a deliberate withholding, a deliberate withholding of one or maybe several sins that we know we've committed and refusing to disclose them to the priest. And people would do such a thing for typically one of two reasons. Either because they're ashamed of what they've done and they don't want to disclose the reality to the priest, or because even though the church has been very clear at identifying a certain action as sinful, they don't personally subscribe to that teaching. And because I don't believe that doing this is a sin, I refuse to confess it. There is a grave implication for these two kinds of thinking, and the implication is the following. As long as we choose to hold on to a sin rather than to submit it to the mercy of God, then we've closed ourselves off from all sacramental grace. And sacramental grace, the grace that comes to us from the valid reception 
of the seven sacraments is the highest form of grace. It is the very life of God that he extends to us, and it is by that fact the only grace that can save us. I had a woman come to me once for confession. It had been 30 years since she had committed a serious sin. She had consciously and deliberately never confessed that sin, although she faithfully went to confession every month. And she was at a daily mass attendee, receiving the Eucharist daily when she attended mass. But the implication of her choice is the following. Because she has chosen to hold on to a sin, rather than to, con, rather than to submit it to the mercy of God, she still possessed the guilt of every one of her sins in those 30 years. Every one of her confessions had been invalid because she had lacked contrition for that one sin. And that means that every Eucharist that she had received in the masses she had attended had been received in the state of unworthiness. Paul talks about those individuals who receive the body of Christ in the state of unworthiness in the 11th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians, where he states, those who receive the body of Christ unworthily will answer for what they did to the body of Christ on the cross. They will be responsible, in other words, for the crucifixion of God's Son. In fact, Paul goes on to say in that same chapter, because many of you Corinthians have received the body of Christ in the state of unworthiness, that is why many of you are physically sick today. And that is why, in fact, some in your community have died. Paul identifies that to receive the Eucharist in the state of grace is life-giving. But to receive the Eucharist in the state of unworthiness brings death. The Eucharist, according to Paul, can kill you. The fourth handcuff. Do you want to hear the fourth one? The fourth handcuff is a refusal. Now, do you notice a pattern emerging here? Four handcuffs, four refusals. And to refuse God is the creed of Satan. In fact, the refusal of God is the only sin that has ever been committed. Every sin boils down to that. It is a rejection of what God wants. The fourth handcuff is a refusal to extend forgiveness to those who have hurt and who have wounded us. And we've all been hurt, every one of us. Some of us have been hurt horribly. Multiple times, for example, I have met with and counseled parents of children that have been murdered. Many, many times I have met with and counseled the victims of rape. But our God is a funny God. He's a funny God. He will accept murderers at his table. He will accept rapists and the worst kind of sinners. But he has said over and over in his word that he will not tolerate someone who is unable to forgive. In that sense, the person that refuses to extend forgiveness is so unlike God, he or she cannot stand in his presence. And so friends, as you're listening to me and examining your own consciences, if you discover within yourselves one or more of these handcuffs or any others, because certainly my list of four is not exhaustive, there are many ways to say no to God. If you at least make the decision today, right now, that you're going to get rid of them, that if you're not going to Mass every Sunday, that you're going to do so, that if you're not frequenting the sacrament of confession regularly, that you're going to do so. Going once a year is not regularly. Even less so is once every two. That you're going to make a complete disclosure of your sins when you do go to confession. In other words, that you're going to be honest with God about your sinfulness. And that you're going to release those people from the debt that they owe you through forgiveness. If you choose to make those decisions today, right now, even from where you're sitting, then you will experience the presence and power of the living God today in a way unlike you've ever experienced before. I guarantee you.
take me up on this offer. How I'm going to proceed is I'm going to show you a list of scriptures to which the church points to in its theology of relics. I'm going to use those scriptures to relate to you that theology so that we're very clear on what a relic is and what a relic is not. Afterwards, I'm going to talk about some very special relics that are here, and then I'm going to conclude with the story of one saint, in particular a saint I think you will find pretty special. And so what I would ask you to do is to just sit back and to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you through the content you're going to see and hear. Because the Holy Spirit is going to show up. He always does. Your job is to let him inside. Now, one more piece of information that I will share with you, information I think that will interest you. Pope Francis has granted a plenary indulgence to all those who attend this exposition. So by virtue of you being present here this evening, you may obtain a plenary indulgence. What is a plenary indulgence? To explain that, I need to explain what sin is and what sin does. When we sin, two things occur. We incur guilt, and our soul incurs deformity. Sacramental confession removes the guilt, but the deformity remains. And that just makes sense, because a heart that sins is a sinful heart. The heart is changed by the sin it commits. It is deformed by it. That deformed heart has to be reformed in God's image and likeness before we can ever enter into God's presence in heaven. Because heaven is, by definition, the realm of the saints. There are no non-saints in heaven. Every soul that is in heaven is, by definition, a saint. Now, ask yourselves, of those people whom you have personally known who have already died, how many, by the time of their death, were you 100% certain that they were dying as saints? If you're like me, you haven't known very many. And so that is what the state of purgatory is for, it is that state of purgation whereby through suffering a soul is purified so that it may enter into God's presence in heaven. A plenary indulgence is an act by the Pope whereby he uses his authority as the successor of St. Peter, an authority described in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew where Peter is given the authority to bind and to loosen on behalf of the entire church it is a decree of the Pope whereby he simply mandates a removal of one's accrued time in purgatory. And so if you obtain that indulgence here today, in terms of purgatory for you, the reset button is set back to zero, and you begin your life from this point forward with a blank slate. And so to put the value of this gift in perspective, at Fatima, in the apparitions, the three visionary children asked Our Lady about the eternal state of the soul of a woman whom they knew who had recently died. And Our Lady's response to that query was, she will remain in purgatory until the end of the world. So the fact that you're getting a plenary indulgence, the fact that it's available for you tonight is a, is a pretty good deal. And so to obtain that indulgence here today, you need to fulfill four conditions. The first is Sometime today, you need to pray for the Pope and for his intentions. One Our Father and one Hail Mary satisfies that condition. So let's do it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The second condition is sometime in the next three weeks, Sometime in the next 20 days, you need to go to the sacramental confession. Fourthly, sometime in the next 20 days, you need to receive Holy Communion. That is, after going to confession, sometime in the next 20 days, 
you will then need to receive Holy Communion. The fourth condition is in some sense the most difficult, although it involves doing nothing outside of yourself. It means making the decision today to separate yourself from all forms of sin, even minor sin, or what we would call in theology, venial sin. It means making the decision that you're going to do everything in your power to never sin again. Now, it doesn't mean that if you do happen to sin again, you lose the indulgence that you gain today. Once you gain an indulgence, you cannot lose it. But what it does mean is you need to make a decision to sever any ongoing attachment or relationship that you have with a particular sin. And I'm going to use the example of lying to flesh out what that means. Right? Lying is a great example because as confessors, we priests hear, hear the sin of lying all the time, all the time. Now, lying is a great example to explain about this sin because our Lord in the gospel defines the devil in relation to lying. He says the devil is a liar and the father of lies. And when the devil lies, our Lord says, he is only acting according to his nature because, and then our Lord repeats again, he is a liar and the father of lies. So when you lie, guess who you're asking to be your father? You're asking the wrong dude. Now, nobody gets up in the morning and decides, you know what, today I'm going to lie five times, right? No, nobody does this. But yet many of us, most of us, we lie. Right? We lie. We have an ongoing relationship with the sin of lying. Right? And we may even personally dislike lying, but a difficult situation comes along and we reach in our back pocket where we keep the sin of lying, and we play that sin card. Huh? That relationship, that ongoing relationship, even, even if there is no actual sin, the closeness or that possibility of, of committing that sin, that is what that fourth condition is demanding that we eradicate. And lying is just merely one example, right? There are many. I mean, I am astounded, for example, as to how many Christians commit theft. You may not be walking to a bank and robbing it, but do you steal from your employer? Do you make counterfeit copies of movies, software, music for which the owners have not been compensated? That's called theft. I am astounded as to how many Christians practice contraception or how many Christians get into the ballot box to exercise their, their democratic right and they don't put life at the top of their list of the needs of our community and society and nation. And so friends, that fourth condition is not simply a matter of rattling off another prayer, another memorized prayer. It means taking an honest look at your moral life. And where is it in terms of congruency from what Jesus Christ demands of us? And if you make that decision to bring it into congruency tonight, you will obtain a plenary indulgence, which is a pretty good deal and a pretty big deal. And so I would encourage you to do everything in your power to obtain that this evening. A plenary indulgence may be obtained for oneself or you are free to apply it to the soul of someone who has already died. The first reference to relics occurs in the Old Testament in the second book of Kings where we read, Elisha died and was buried. Elisha was one of the holiest men in the Old Testament. At the time, bands of Moabites used to raid the land each year. Once, some people were burying a man when suddenly they spied such a raiding band. So they cast the dead man into the grave of Elisha, and everyone went off. But when the man came in contact with the bones of Elisha, he came back to life and rose to his feet. From Matthew in the New Testament, a woman suffering hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the tassel on his cloak. She said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I shall be cured. Jesus turned around and saw her and said, courage, daughter, your faith has saved you. And from that hour, the woman was cured. Notice she didn't touch Jesus, but his clothing, and that was enough for the healing.
from the Acts of the Apostles. So extraordinary were the mighty deeds God accomplished at the hands of Paul, that when face cloths or aprons that touched his skin were applied to the sick, their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So what is going on here? In each instance, God has brought about a healing using a material object. The vehicle for the healing was the touching of that object. It is very important to note, however, that the cause of the healing is God. The relics are a means that he chooses. In other words, relics are not magic. They do not contain a power that is their own, a power separate from God. Any good that comes about through a relic is God's doing. But the fact that God chooses to use the relics of saints to work healing and miracles tells us that he wants to draw our attention to the saints as models and intercessors. And so what is a relic? Relics are of three kinds. First-class relics are the body or fragments of the body of a saint. For example, pieces of bone or flesh. Second-class relics are something that a saint personally owned. For example, a shirt or a book or fragments of those items. Third-class relics are those items that a saint touched or that have been touched to a first, second, or another third-class relic of a saint. There are 165 relics set up in the building here today. All but six of them are first-class relics, those six being second-class relics. With regard to third-class relics, whatever objects of devotion that you have brought with you, rosaries, holy cards, medals, your wedding bands, whatever you touch to the reliquaries will itself become a third-class relic. Why does the church venerate relics? Simply because relics are connected with the Holy Spirit. In the case of first-class relics, they were temples of the Holy Spirit. In a mystical way, the Holy Spirit dwelt within them. And we hear from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Relics are usually housed in something called a teka, a small locket with a glass window through which the relic may be seen. A teka always displays the relic in a prominent place within it, almost always in the center. Each contains the name of the saint. The back of a teka is always sealed with string or wire, and a wax imprint containing the coat of arms of a bishop, abbot, or a postulator, and these are the three authorities delegated by the church to issue relics. Uh, now, I know you all know what a bishop is. An abbot is simply the head of a monastery. He is the superior of a monastic community. And a postulator is that individual who has the charge of promoting a cause of canonization. When the church believes someone who has died might be a saint, it conducts an investigation of the life of that individual, and it assigns one person the task of overseeing that investigation. That person is called a postulator. It is the job of the postulator to assemble the evidence for sainthood and to present that evidence to the Holy See on behalf of the people of God if and when the person being investigated is beatified or declared blessed, which is the last step before canonization or declaration as a saint, then the postulator has the authority at that point to issue relics. Now, on the screen, you're looking at the back of a tacca. You can see the strings that have been threaded through the sides of that metal tacca. The ends of those strings have been tied to, to one another in the center and over top of the knot, hot wax has been placed, and a bishop has impressed his signet ring into the wax, leaving behind the impression of his coat of arms. 
The church seals Attaka in this manner for one reason, to establish authenticity. As long as those strings in that seal are intact, one can be certain the relic inside that Taka has not been tampered with since the date of its issue, because it would be impossible to get at the relic inside that Taka without doing damage to the strings or the seal or both. And once that has been done, it is impossible to restore that Taka back to its original condition. It will be obvious it had been tampered with. So this is a very simple but very effective means of ensuring authenticity. And the church takes the authenticity of relics very, very seriously. Tekkas with seals or threads that have been broken are forbidden to be used in public veneration. There is always a document issued with a tekka. The document always states the name and authority of who issued the relic. It contains the seal of the issuing authority and the date of the sealing. The seal of the document matches that of the taka exactly. It contains the signature of the issuing authority. But very importantly, the document always states what exactly is in the taka. In this case, it is a particle ex ossibus, which is Latin for from the bones of St. Francis of Assisi. And other than ex ossibus, the most common types of relics are ex indumentis from the clothing. But why divide the saints' bodies? While dividing and displaying the saints' bodies, may sound strange and unusual, the church does this to respect the saints. It does it because they deserve it. The Mass is the church's participation in the sacrifice of Christ and is its highest and most sacred prayer. The early church had to celebrate Mass in secret, Christianity was outlawed, and it often did so over the tombs of those who were martyred for their faith. This was out of reverence for them. The church continues the same practice today. It is customary to place a saint's relic inside every church altar. It is usually contained within a marble stone in the center of the altar. This stone is what the priest reverences at the start and at the end of mass when he kisses the altar. It is the relic stone he is kissing. And that's what a typical relic stone looks like. I simply lifted up the altar cloth of a church I was visiting, and I snapped a picture of what I saw. The relic is encased in the center of the stone within a recessed hole, which is then covered with a smaller stone. Evidence of holiness and of the experience of heaven, the incorruptible saints. What you're looking at on the screen right now is a modern-day photograph of the body of St. Bernadette of Lourdes. Bernadette, of course, is famous for having been the young woman to whom our Blessed Mother appeared at Lourdes, France in 1858. Bernadette has been dead over 140 years. That's what her body looks like today. And absolutely nothing has been done to preserve it in this current state. Towards the right of the screen is again a modern day photograph of Bernadette. Towards the left is a photograph taken from just before her funeral in 1879. How this was discovered was during the process of Bernadette's beatification, which as I mentioned, is the last step before canonization or declaration as a saint. One of the rites performed leading up to the beatification is the exhumation of the grave in which the future blessed was buried. And whatever mortal remains are discovered, these are collected and placed inside a church. That is an honor and dignity that every blessed receives. Now, beatification happens typically several decades at the, at, after the death of the individual, at best, 
And after decades, depending upon the condition of the soil of the cemetery, sometimes not even skeletal remains survive. In the case of Bernadette, it was known the cemetery in which he had been buried was very damp, and so they were hoping to find at least part of the skeleton to have her relics. But when they opened her grave, what they discovered was her body lying whole and intact in the ground. There was no decomposition to her body whatsoever. Now the clothing that she was buried in, which you see her pictured wearing on the left, there was so much moisture in that grave, much of her clothing had disintegrated, had rotted away. And the rosary that she's holding in her hands in that same picture, she was also buried with. And there was so much moisture in that grave, the metal chain holding the glass beads together had rusted. And in some places, it had rusted so completely that it was non-existent. And so many of those beads were scattered in the ground around Bernadette's body, but there was no decomposition to her body whatsoever. Now with this discovery, the church had a little bit of a problem on its hands, and the problem was this. It did not want to be accused of having played a trick on the faithful, of somehow having staged a fake miracle with the body of the very famous Bernadette in order to artificially increase the faith of the people. So what the church decided to do to show that it was being completely objective and that it had not faked anything is it decided to hire a forensic scientist to perform an examination on Bernadette's body to try to determine scientifically why she had not decayed. And to further give credit to its case that it had absolutely nothing to hide, the church made sure the scientist it hired was an atheist. Being an atheist, he wouldn't believe in God and would most certainly not believe in miracles and so would be certain he could find a natural explanation as to why Bernadette's body had not decayed. So the church hired a very famous pathologist from Paris, a man who was a well-known atheist. When he began the examination on Bernadette's body, he opened her body at its abdomen. Once he had her abdomen open, what he noted was there was no smell of decomposition coming from within the body. In fact, he noted there wasn't even the typical smell present within any body, such as yours or mine. What he noted that he could smell, however, was the scent of roses coming from within the body. He examined her internal organs and noted there was no decomposition in any of them. On the contrary, when he examined her liver, he noted there was fresh blood dripping from it. His conclusion is that science has no explanation as to why Bernadette's body had not decayed. He could find no evidence of any artificial chemicals in her system, nor any evidence of a mechanical process used to produce this current state. And I will add that shortly after submitting his final report to the church, that scientist converted to the Catholic faith. Bernadette's body is on public display. It is on display in the town of Nevers, France, the same town in which she died. I have seen her several times and can assure you she is so perfectly preserved, she looks like she's leaned back and is having a nap. For that reason, Bernadette is often referred to as the sleeping saint of Nevers. Other incorruptibles include St. John Vianney, who has been dead over 160 years. And so in the case of the incorruptibles, we have a scriptural promise that is fulfilled from Psalm 16. And so my heart rejoices, my soul is glad. Even my body shall rest in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, nor let your beloved know decay. St. Peter quotes this same passage in Acts, and he applies it specifically to Jesus. And so now following Christ, who is the firstborn from the dead, we know that this promise applies to us as well. In other words, the incorruptible bodies of certain saints are signs of the life to come, 
where, where there will be no death. They point to what awaits us. I'm going to take a moment now and explain about two very special relics that are here. The first is a portion of the veil of Our Lady, a portion of the cloth worn by the Mother of God on her head while she was alive on earth. Uh, now we, of course, have no first-class relics of Our Lady, she having, of course, been assumed body and soul into heaven upon completion of her earthly life. But her belongings remained on earth, and these were revered by the church in Jerusalem, by the church founded upon the apostles. Her veil was kept in Jerusalem, where it was held in great veneration until approximately the year, the year 400, when it was then taken to Rome by St. Jerome, the church father, and it was placed by Jerome in the Basilica of St. Anastasia, where he was the parish priest and where it remains to this day. Some years ago, a portion was removed and was then given to this ministry to allow for worldwide veneration. Uh, so do take some time and pray in front of the veil of Our Lady, she, of course, being the greatest of the saints. The other significant relic is wood from the cross upon which our Lord died, which is always referred to as the true cross. And these are some of the largest remaining fragments of the true cross in the world. Now, I'm often asked, and it is a very good question, how do we know that this is wood from the cross upon which our Lord died? And there's a very good answer to that very good question. In the year 315, the Emperor Constantine converted. This was the first time in the history of the Roman Empire that the Emperor was a Christian. The Roman Empire was the largest empire the world had ever seen and remains so to this day. It consisted of all of Europe, Northern Africa, and Western Asia, an incredibly huge landmass. Constantine's desire was to convert his entire people to the Christian faith. One of the best ways he thought he could do that was to bring relics back from the Holy Land, relics pertaining to the life of our Lord, back to Rome, and he thought that his people's contact with these holy objects would produce conversions. So what Constantine did was send his mother, St. Helen, to the Holy Land to do just that, to bring back relics pertaining to the life of our Lord. Now what Helen did was visit the sites where the events of our Lord's passion occurred. For example, she arrived at Pontius Pilate's Praetorium, his palace, and she removed the stairs leading up to it. She sent those stairs back to Rome, and Constantine, Constantine upon receiving them, erected them, and built a very large basilica church around them. And you can still go to Rome to this day and see those stairs. Helen was, of course, so interested in those stairs because our Lord was condemned inside the praetorium, meaning that he had to walk up and down those stairs, making them a relic. But Helen was shown a vision. She was given a revelation as to where she would find the wood of the true cross. She was shown a field on the west side of the city of Jerusalem, a field just outside the wall that surrounded the city, and it was a field that matched the Roman and the biblical description as to the place of the crucifixion exactly. And Helen was told to have her soldiers go and dig there. Helen had her men dig up that entire field, and they found many, many crosses. They didn't find just one cross. And they found many pieces of wood and timber in addition. And so the question now becomes, which of these crosses or these pieces of wood, if any, is wood from the cross upon which our Lord died? Well, Helen was very clever. She brought in a woman who was very sick and who was very close to death, and she had her lay down on each cross and each piece of wood one by one. Well, there was one cross on which she lay down. She was healed instantly. And Helen said... That's our cross. This is wood from that cross brought back, from, brought back to Rome from Jerusalem by Helen. This is the relic, the man I told you about earlier, the one who had been born paralyzed. This is the relic he touched when he received the healing of his paralysis. Uh, so do take some time and pray in front of the wood of the true cross. Uh, but as you do so, I'm going to place somewhat of a restriction on, on things. 
As you can see, there's a, a great number of people here tonight. I, I haven't received a head count yet, but I would estimate there's somewhere around 400. I'm going to ask you to limit your time in front of the wood of the true cross and of the veil of Our Lady to 15 seconds. 15 seconds. I, I'm afraid we're going to have to put a limit because if we all take as long as we want, we will be here until the start of Advent, ensuring that everyone has a turn. Huh? Now, in the exposition today, there is no start point and there is no end point. Yeah, you can begin anywhere you like, uh, in the room where the relics are displayed, and you can roam about freely. But around these two relics, the true cross and the veil, lineups always form. So here's some advice. Do your praying as you're standing in line, so that when you approach the relic, you can take a good look at it and take in the experience of touching the relic, because you only got 15 seconds. Once you've gone through the line, if you wish to go back into the same line, you are free to do so, but I would ask you for the sake of the others who are here, the others who are waiting, to please respect that 15 second time limit. Looking around the church, I can see there's some people here who are visibly infirm, uh, some who are quite aged, uh, and some with very young children. I'm gonna, we're just gonna all agree together right now that if for whatever reason someone is unable to stand in line, that those persons can cut to the front of the line. Deal? Thank you. I'm going to move on now into the final part of my talk. As I do so, I would like to briefly revisit the four handcuffs with which I began. Refusing to attend Mass on Sunday, refusing to confess one's sins regularly, refusing to make an honest and complete confession, refusing to forgive. I've been doing this ministry over two decades. In that time period, people have overwhelmingly identified the fourth handcuff, forgiveness, as the most difficult to overcome. And so what I would like to do in the final part of this talk is to speak to that fourth handcuff and to give you the tools with which to eliminate it from your life. Because my goal with these expositions is not just that you come and encounter the relics of the saints, I want you to come here and become saints yourselves. I'm going to present to you a model an example of forgiveness that is going to make it much easier to forgive. Our teacher for this model is going to be a little girl of 11 years old who happens to be one of the youngest canonized saints in the Catholic Church, St. Maria Goretti. St. Maria Goretti died in 1902, so just over 100 years ago, which in the 2000 year history of the church is not a long time ago. In other words, Maria is very much a modern saint. She was born in Italy to a poor family, a family that settled in a town called Natuno. Natuno is 40 miles directly south of Rome, the capital. Her father was a farmer, but he was so poor he didn't own any land with which to farm. And so to provide for his family, he hired himself out to a wealthy landowner. And the agreement that he came up with with a landowner is that he would be given a certain number of fields to cultivate for which he would be responsible for producing a certain quota of crops, which he would then turn over to the landowner. Whatever he could produce over and above that quota, he could keep for his own family's use. In addition, he and his family could live in an abandoned warehouse that the landowner had on the property. Maria's father worked very hard to eke out a living for his family on that land. And for two years, things went reasonably well. They were still very poor, but at least they had food. But then unfortunately, a tragedy occurred. He was bit by a mosquito carrying the malaria parasite, and he died of malaria 10 days later. This left the family in a very difficult position because he left behind a wife and six children. And it was decided the only way the family could hope to survive would be for his wife to take over his place on the farm, and for Maria, at her young age, to take over her mother's place in the home, doing all the cooking, all the cleaning, and the raising of her five brothers and sisters. It would now be Maria's job to have the role of mom. Maria took to her new responsibilities with great diligence. She wanted nothing more than to alleviate the suffering that her mother was experiencing, trying to keep up with the demands of that farm. But around the same time, Maria's next door neighbor, a big 20-year-old man named Alessandro Serenelli 
started to take an impure liking towards Maria. And at first, he would say rude and crude things to her, things that were embarrassing and inappropriate, and that would cause her to run away. And the more she reacted, the more that he liked it. But he eventually revealed to her he wanted her to give up her virginity to him, and that he wasn't going to take no for an answer, and that if he needed to hurt her very badly to get what he wanted, then so much the better. Now, Maria wanted nothing to do with Alessandro, but you see, she was in a very difficult position. She didn't have a father around to protect her, and her mother was at her wit's end trying to keep up with the demands of that farm. And Alessandro had manipulated the situation in that he would assist her mother with some of the more difficult farm tasks. So Maria's mother viewed Alessandro as a friend, as a good neighbor. For that reason, Maria re didn't reveal to her mother what Alessandro was threatening her with because she knew that if she did so, then her mother would sever the relationship between the family and Alessandro by moving the family away. And the family had nowhere to go. So if it came to that, the family may not survive. But one day when Alessandro knew Maria was home alone, he approached the house with an object identical to this one. This is a five inch long four-sided metal file used to sharpen the blades on farm instruments in Italy during that time period. It's mounted on a wooden handle. Alessandro had ground the tip of it down to a point. And he placed the end of that file against Maria and said to her, Maria, unless you do what I want you to do, I will kill you. Maria refused. In his anger, he stabbed Maria with that file nine times. And he stabbed her with such force, the file went in her body on one side and came out the other for six of the nine wounds. For the three that didn't, they didn't because he hit her spine. And he hit her spine so hard, he bent the file. Maria fell to the floor of her kitchen unconscious. He thought he had killed her, but at this point, she was only unconscious. And he went next door and locked himself inside his room. At a certain point, Maria regained consciousness, and she managed to drag herself along the floor of her kitchen to the door which was about six feet away. And she reached up and she flipped, the, and she managed to flip the latch holding the door closed so that she could make an attempt to open the door and cry out for help. Alessandro heard her flip that latch and he came back and he stabbed her five more times. It was these second wounds that would kill Maria 24 hours later. He pierced her intestines. And what began to happen was an outflowing of the contents of her intestines into her body. And this causes an infection known as peritonitis, the same infection that you would get if your appendix burst. By the time that Maria was found, she already had a fever. By the time she was taken to the hospital, which was a great distance away, the fever, combined with the loss of blood she had sustained, put her in a state of dehydration. And so upon arriving at the hospital, she begged the doctors over and over for water. But the doctors wouldn't give her any water because whatever she would swallow would come out her perforated intestines and would induce peritonitis. And they were trying to save her. It was a local priest who had been called to the hospital that posed this question to Maria. He asked her, Maria, our Lord from the cross also begged for water, but no one gave him any. Will you also offer up your thirst for sinners? And she replied, yes, Father, I will. And she never asked for anything again. They performed surgery on her to try to stop the internal bleeding, but because she had lost so much blood, they didn't give her any anesthetic. They didn't think her heart was strong enough. They thought if she were to be given anesthetic, that would induce cardiac arrest. And so throughout that surgery, in which they enlarged every one of Maria's wounds so that they could suture her internally, Maria felt every movement of the surgeon's blade and hands. 
Throughout that surgery, Maria never cried out and never complained once. She offered everything up for the salvation of sinners. When they were done the surgery, the internal bleeding continued, and so it was clear Maria would not survive. But before she died, she said these words. I forgive Alessandro Serenelli, and I want him with me in heaven forever. She died. Alessandro, for his part, was taken to trial, at which he pleaded innocence. He said he was defending himself from the attack of Maria Goretti. Now, just as you don't believe him, neither did the judge, and he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And it is said Alessandro Serenelli went to prison the most angry man on earth. He blamed Maria for everything and kept repeating over and over again how if she had just done what he wanted her to do, none of this would have happened. And in fact, he was so filled with anger, he couldn't be allowed to mix with the other inmates because he would always cause violence when he was permitted to be around anyone else. And so he was locked in isolation, placed in solitary confinement, separated from every other inmate, and he remained in isolation for six years until one night. One night, Maria appeared to him. And she didn't say anything to him, but she appeared in a garden picking 14 white lily flowers. And she handed those flowers to him one by one. Now, the number 14 is significant because it was 14 times he had stabbed her. So with this gesture, what Maria is saying to Alessandro is, I forgive you. Well, that act of forgiveness, that act of love, filled Alessandro with light and with the Holy Spirit. And he immediately became contrite for what he had done to that little girl. He asked for the local bishop and he requested the sacrament of reconciliation at which he confessed having murdered her. And shortly after that occasion, there were tens of thousands of these little prayer cards printed up, just like you see on the screens, and they were distributed all over Italy and Europe. They had an image of Maria Goretti on one side and a prayer asking God to grant her canonization as a saint on the other. One day there was a construction worker digging at the base of a building in Rome. From the top of the building, a large stone block fell onto his foot, completely crushing his foot, damaging it so badly, shattering every bone within it, nothing could be done to repair it. All they could do was prepare the man for an amputation they would perform the following morning. But his wife, who had been called to the hospital, placed one of these prayer cards in and amongst his bandaging. The next day, they placed the man on top of the operating table, and they had the saw ready to begin cutting into his leg. When they removed his bandaging, they discovered there was not a single thing wrong with his foot. There were no broken bones. There was no bruising. There was not a scratch on that man's foot. There was nothing wrong with that foot. That man got up off the operating table and went right back outside to work. He never missed a single day's work. All because Maria chose to forgive. Because she chose to be a saint. And because Maria made that choice, Alessandro Serenelli, having received the mercy of God through the forgiveness of Maria Goretti, began to live a holy life himself, even within prison. He began to read the Bible, he developed a prayer life, and he would evangelize the other inmates. And he was released after 27 years. He had been sentenced to 30 years in prison, but he was released three years early because his person had completely changed. In those days, nobody was let out early. One of the first things he did upon his release was seek out and find the mother of Maria Goretti. He approached the door of her house, and he knocked on it. For you to understand what happened next, I have to go back in time slightly. Maria's job in the family was to have the role of mom. She was in charge of all the domestic responsibilities. When Maria died, there was no one left able to take her place. And her mother couldn't both look after the responsibilities of the farm and meet the needs of her family. 
So the same week that Maria Goretti died, her mother had to give up all five remaining children to adoption. Alessandro didn't just murder her little girl, he destroyed her family. She never even got to go to Maria's funeral because it was held on one of the last days she had with her remaining children. 27 years later, there's a knock on her door and she opens the door. There she is standing face to face with the man that had brought so much misery upon her. He asked her, Asunta, do you know who I am? And she replied, yes, I know who you are. He asked her, do you forgive me? And she replied, Alessandro, God has forgiven you. Maria has forgiven you. How can I not forgive you? And she accepted him that day as her own son, and she adopted him. That was December 24th, 1934, Christmas Eve. And they both went to midnight Christmas Mass together and received Holy Communion side by side. Maria Assunta Goretti and her daughter's murderer, all because Maria chose to forgive. Because she chose to be a saint. And because Maria made that choice, her mother had the glory and honor of being present at St. Peter's Square when the Holy Father, Pope Pius XII, proclaimed her little girl a saint and raised her to the glory of the church's altars. In the history of the Catholic Church, that event has no parallel. Never, except in the case of Maria Goretti, has a parent of the saint been present to witness the canonization. And on that day in June 1950, over half a million people descended upon St. Peter's Square to, wit to witness the canonization of that little girl. That was the largest crowd in the history of the Catholic Church to that point in time. A crowd so large that for the first time in its history, St. Peter's Basilica, the largest church in the world, a church that could easily hold over 100 of your churches inside it, that was the first time in its history it could not be used for a canonization because it was too small. And so Maria's canonization was the first one in history to occur outside in the square. And because Maria made that choice, Alessandro Serenelli went on to live a very holy life himself. In fact, I believe he too one day will be canonized a saint. He ended up becoming a Franciscan Capuchin lay brother and he lived such a transformed life of piety, gentleness, and holiness that even the children of the village in which he lived, even the children called him Uncle Alessandro. And there is an effort now to begin his cause of canonization because of the effects of his reputed holiness during his life and also after his death. But friends, this story would not turn out this way. This story would not have the happy ending that it does had Maria not made that very difficult choice that she did. Had she not chosen to forgive. Had she not chosen to be a saint. You see, nobody in the world would have blamed Maria for not forgiving Alessandro. Who would blame her? He wanted to do ugly things to her and he attacked her brutally because she wouldn't cooperate. And here's the kicker. He had no repentance in his heart whatsoever, none. He didn't want to be forgiven. But Maria didn't put her faith in a situation. She put her faith in God. And that God whom she loved, she knew, demands the forgiveness of our enemies. And if that's what my God wants from me, she thought, then that's what he's going to get from me. And because she made that choice, that little, that little 11 year old girl left this world a saint. Last March, it was the anniversary of me being at a church along the Gulf Coast. It was a Friday night. I was approached by a young 18-year-old man. He had come down with cancer in his left thigh bone. How he knew there was a problem is he had been standing on his leg and the bone snapped. He went to the hospital and all the doctors could do was prepare him for an amputation they would perform in one week's time. 
Three days before that surgery was scheduled, he came to see me and he asked me if I knew of a saint that could help him. Well, I remembered that Maria saved that man's foot from amputation. I told him her story, just like I've told you. Afterwards, I said to him, Maria was able to accomplish such a great good because she gave Jesus exactly what he wanted. Maria did not negotiate with God. I said, why don't you do the same? Why don't you make an act of forgiveness towards everyone who has ever hurt you, even if you've already forgiven them 10 times in the past, just renew that forgiveness now in honor of Maria. Afterwards, I'll place her relic on your leg and say a prayer asking God for your healing. Well, in the course of our talking, he revealed to me that as a young boy, he had been hurt very badly by a certain individual and that that hurt had been prolonged over a number of years and that he was still very much to this day experiencing the effects of that hurt. And so I said to him, not because that person who hurt you deserves forgiveness, no one deserves forgiveness, you don't deserve it, I don't deserve it, but so that God can do something beautiful in your life and in that person's life who hurt you, just like he did in Maria's and in her assassins, are you willing to forgive in imitation of Maria? And so he agreed, and he made an act of forgiveness for everything he had experienced at the hands of that individual. Afterwards, I asked him, are you willing to forgive yourself for everything you've ever done for which you would hold yourself in contempt or self-hatred? And you know what, friends? He had a much more difficult time with that one. And that's what I have seen at my entire priesthood. Almost always, the hardest person to forgive is that person staring back at us in the mirror. I said to him, if you refuse to forgive yourself, you cannot receive God's grace because you would be withholding from someone the mercy that he wants you to give, even though in this case you were both the giver and the recipient. And I said to him, Bud, right now, you need all the grace you can get. And so he agreed to forgive himself and made an act of forgiveness for everything for which he held himself in contempt. I took Maria's relic and placed it on his thigh and said a prayer asking God to heal his leg through the intercession of St. Maria Goretti. Three days later, he went to the hospital for his amputation. In the operating room, they opened his thigh and they found no cancer and they found no broken bone. They closed his leg up again and there is nothing wrong with that young man's leg today. All because Maria chose to forgive because she chose to be a saint you see friends Maria is not dead she has never been more alive and she has taught us the reason why you were created the reason why I was created is to be a saint and the only tragedy in life and there's only one is if we leave this world not having become a saint and she has even taught us what it takes to be a saint it means saying yes to God and to his will in every circumstance and situation. It means putting our faith in God and not in the circumstances and situations in which we find ourselves. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Perhaps with me, you can recite this closing prayer. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose gift we venerate in one celebration the merits of all the saints, bestow on us, we pray, through the prayers of so many intercessors, an abundance of the reconciliation with you for which we earnestly long. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever, amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, before we begin the veneration, I'm just going to explain what you may do and what you may And two gold ones here in the church. Whatever is on the blue tables downstairs, you may pick up. Uh, you may bless yourselves with the relics, touch your holy objects to them, touch pictures of your friends and family.
samples that you not pick up. Uh, they're very heavy and very fragile, and I'm worried they may fall and get damaged. That is the two tables that are here in the church. You may touch them. You may touch anything on these tables here in front of me, but I would just ask you to refrain from picking up what is on them. Of everything I've told you here today, what I'm going to say right now is probably the most important. There is going to be one, at least one, that is going to reach out and communicate with you in a personal way. There's going to be one saint that is going to say to you, I want to be your friend. Your job today, the reason why you're here, and frankly, the reason why I come here, is for you to find your saint. Now, how will you identify who is trying to befriend you? Well, I don't know, so please don't come and ask me. <laughs> but what I can do is describe to you what you need to do to perceive that communication. Just as God is not a bully, just as he is a perfect gentleman, the same realities apply to his saints. No saint is going to force himself or herself upon you unwanted or undesired. So how do you perceive that communication? I started off this talk with the discussion of handcuffs. If you perceive within yourself one or more of these handcuffs that I mentioned, or, or any others, before you be, even get out of the pew that you're in, make a decision in front of our Eucharistic Lord here that you're going to get rid of it. Make a decision, a commitment to the Lord that you're going to get your life right with him. He will your way to the first relics. Begin with a prayer to this as yet unknown saint of yours. There is no right or wrong way to say such a prayer as long as it comes from the heart. But it might sound something like this. I don't know who you are, but I welcome your offer of friendship and I accept it. Speak to me loudly and clearly so that I may perceive who you are. Next, be attentive to what you experience as you go around visiting the relics. Some people describe experiencing something extraordinary. Many people have told me, for example, when they stood in front of one relic, they've heard church bells ringing or heard a very sweet singing, but that they've heard these things not so much with their ears but somehow inside them. Others smell something. Um, others hear something. Many people, um, um, well, I've mentioned that already. They, they, they feel, they hear, uh, they smell. Most people, though, have a less sensory experience, less an experience involving the senses, but one more involving the heart. For example, they stand in front of one relic, and they just know they're standing in front of something very, very holy. And still others, it's a detail or fact about the life of the saint printed on the card that accompanies each relic that just strikes a chord or a resonance. What you're looking for is which saint touches you the most deeply. For which saint do you find a love or an affection, a connection that is new and that is easy? That is that saint's way of saying, I'm choosing you. Remember who that saint is and include that saint in your prayer life every day because that saint will intercede for you in front of the throne of God in heaven until one day, God willing, you meet one another face to face in glory. If you receive a healing, either today or in this next week, I better hear about it. And you know that gospel where Jesus heals the ten lepers? Remember that gospel? How many came back and thanked him? One. Now, I don't need your thanks because it's not me doing anything, but it gives glory to God to know what he is doing with this ministry. And your sharing with me enables me in turn to share with others, just like I've shared with you what he has done with others. As you make your way downstairs, you're going to pass by tables that have reflection sheets on them. Take a sheet home with you. If a healing manifests itself, please fill out that sheet and mail it in to me. My address is printed on it. Even if you don't receive a healing, maybe you don't need a healing, but you'd like to share your experience here today, feel free to send me your sheet. You'll also find downstairs a listing of all the saints that are here today. I notice that some uh, have already received those sheets. You'll also find on those same tables a copy of my card. My card has this ministry's website printed on it, treasuresofthechurch.com. This is unfortunately my last stop in the state of Washington. From here, I move on to Oregon. If you wish to see where the expositions are held, please visit that website. You'll see a listing of the times and places. From Oregon, I move on to Utah, uh, pardon me, to Idaho and then Utah, uh, and then uh, Colorado and so forth. 
And for heaven's sake, if you know anybody in those areas, please do pass on the word. Uh, these relics have come a long way to visit communities just like yours, and it would be a shame if someone did not attend simply because no one told them about it. Finally, the last thing I will say, the only way that this ministry can continue to exist is through the kind donations of people like yourselves that attend these expositions. This ministry does not charge the parishes it visits a fee, and it does not pass on to them its transportation costs, uh, which are enormous because it travels worldwide. Why would it not do that? Because if it did that, then that would prevent poor communities and third world countries from being able to host an exposition. And I do not want to deprive the anyone the opportunity of visiting the saints. And your support in the ministry will, continue, will enable the, the ministry to continue doing what I like doing best, and that is visiting schools and prisons, especially prisons because they're filled with Alessandro Serenelli's and I love to bring the Maria Goretti and her story of forgiveness. And it is, I just have to, uh, to give a, a public thanks to, uh, to our Lord for bringing what appears to be finally an end to the whole COVID pandemic. Um, this, this ministry was shut down for 15 months. If that shutdown ex extended to this July, so to the end of next month, it would have folded. Uh, it would have gone into insolvency and it wouldn't have uh, the funds anymore to continue, and thank God that that's been averted. Uh, so uh, praise be to God, and it looks like the whole world is beginning to open up again. Uh, praise be to God. People ask me all the time, Father Martins, the teaching you give on relics, the biography you tell of St. Maria Goretti, are they recorded anywhere? And the answer is yes. Together with the Vatican, I recorded a five-part teaching on relics. Today you heard me give three of those five parts. There is a video downstairs that has all five, the three you have heard plus the two you have not. That video features all of the relics in the exhibit in a virtual exposition. But that video has also included with it a second half, and that second half consists of my narrating the complete biography of St. Maria Goretti, which I do inside the Goretti family home, the place where Maria was attacked, and in the hospital room where she died. I think you've been witness today to the power of the story of that little girl, and so I'm going to give you a challenge. I'm going to challenge you to take home one of those videos, but I'm going to challenge you to take home a second copy of that same video that you can pass out to family members and friends and keep on, on permanent loan from person to person. And that can be a simple way, a simple gesture through which you can evangelize, because nobody can hear the story of that little girl and be unmoved. And it is often, friends, through a gesture as simple as passing on a resource containing the account of, of the life of a saint that the greatest conversions can happen as a result. And I speak to you about that reality firsthand. One month ago, it marked 25 years that I converted from atheism, and I did so because someone handed me a simple resource containing the account of the life of a saint. If that person didn't have the courage or the care to do that for me, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. Friends, our faith is meant to be shared, and that's why Scripture calls it the good news. But news isn't news unless it's shared. And so that video has been produced to make it easy to share the good news. Now, unfortunately, the ministry cannot give those videos away. It has to pay to produce them and then ship them to me wherever I am in the world, but it sells them as cheaply as possible. But you know what? Sometimes we leave the house, we've got no money with us, with us, and if that's the case, no problem. Take whatever you like home, just take home a, co a well, I'll give you a slip, and you, whenever you're able to, you can mail a check to my office. Um, you'll also find downstairs a book biography of St. Maria Goretti, which I co-wrote. Um, I'm just gonna answer this question because I, I get it over 100 times a night. No, the books have not been touched to Maria's relics, but you are welcome to do so. And then, yes, the book itself becomes a third-class relic. And if you're looking for something, friends, to give a kid, give a kid the story of St. Maria Goretti. Because if we don't give our children something different than what the world is giving them, our kids are lost. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been praying for you. Um, I'm just going to explain 
how the veneration here in the church will unfold. On this table here, to your left, my right, is the wood of the true cross, a fragment from our Lord's crown of thorns, and a fragment of the lance that pierced our Lord's side. To venerate these relics, you will make a line along this aisleway here. You'll come forward and go across the table to, from left to right, and then you'll retreat back from the center aisle. On that table is a, a fragment of the veil of Our Lady, a portion of the cloak of Joseph. Joseph's body was never found. Uh, all we have is a, the, the cloak or the overcoat that he wore. Uh, that is a fragment, uh, contains a fragment of that. And uh, wood from the manger, wood from the crib of our Lord in Bethlehem. To venerate that table, you will make a line along that, aisle, that side aisleway. You'll go across from, um, from uh, right to left, and then you'll retreat uh, going back to the center aisle. There are, there are a great majority more relics downstairs, so I would highly encourage you, uh, for most of you, to begin downstairs. Um, you can roam about freely upstairs and downstairs, and we have no set shutdown time, so please do be patient with one another and have a wonderful exposition. Thank you, Father Carlos. Wonderful, inspiring presentation. Uh, in trying to juggle the uh, remaining uh, COVID regulations, including Archbishop's uh, requests, uh, and also a, a way of really venerating these relics uh, in a reverent way, uh, we have uh, divided up by tickets. I think some have gold tickets. You're going to go first to uh, either. He's come uh, here for these two tables or go downstairs. And then once uh, the gold has started their veneration and the lines are flowing, then we'll be able to uh, let the greens go and then I think reds and whites. But uh, again, if you're observing that 15 seconds up here, that will help us move people along as quickly as possible. Uh, we, I, I do invite you, given uh, the challenge of bringing a lot of people through the building tonight, uh, I'm going to put you in charge of your comfort zone as far as what you're comfortable with, as far as spacing uh, and time spent uh, with people. But again, we're in the presence of all these uh, relics, and God has uh, blessed us and protect us in so many ways, so we're grateful for uh, your help with that as well. So with that, uh, I would invite uh, the gold uh, ticketed people, if you want to form lines, either upstairs here for these relic tables or go downstairs where there's 165 relics downstairs. If you want to start and uh, uh, begin that uh, veneration, you're welcome. And then once, uh, once they get started and we're ready, uh, with there's enough uh, space, we're going to have the greens go as soon as possible. Again, Jesus is present here. I believe he's also exposed in the chapel, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we have uh, exposition in the chapel. Is that accurate, Debbie? Yeah, so exposition in the chapel as well, if you want to take any time with uh, the Lord in exposition. Exposition. 